Amen. If you're ready for the word, we are going to go first to the book of Numbers, chapter 13. I'm going to do something today that I've never, ever, ever done and may never happen again. I'm reading a passage from the message version. I won't even call it the message Bible. I'll just call it the message version. And then we're going to go to Joshua chapter 5. During the intermission, did you hear how the kids' church was bumping? Oh, my gosh. I went backstage, and the, the subs... I think they were singing, here come the men in black, won't let you remember. That's what it sounded like to me, so I don't know what they're doing with the men in black, but <laughs> low-key, I'd like to be in kids' church today. Numbers 13, starting in verse 26, uh, Joshua and Caleb have, in a whole bunch of Israelites have been checking out the promised land to see what's there and who is there and what it's about and what's going on. And they've come back to give the report. And that's where we find this. They presented themselves before Moses and Aaron and the whole congregation of the people of Israel in the wilderness of Paran at Kadesh. They reported to the whole congregation to the whole congregation and showed them the fruit of the land. They brought the fruit back, had to carry it on staves over their shoulders. Huge clusters of grapes. Then they told the story of their trip. We went to the land to which you sent us, and oh it does flow with milk and honey. Just look at this fruit. The only thing is that the people who live there are fierce. Their cities are huge and well fortified. Worse yet, we saw descendants of the giant Anak. Amalekites are spread out in the Negev. Hittites, Jebusites, Amorites hold the hill country. And the Canaanites are established on the Mediterranean Sea and along the Jordan. Caleb interrupted, called for silence before Moses, and said, Let's go up and take the land now. We can do it. But the others said, We can't attack those people. They're way stronger than we are. Kicked my vocalese. They're, they're way stronger than we are. They spread scary rumors among the people of Israel. They said, we scouted out the land from one end to the other. It's a land that swallows people whole. Everybody we saw was huge. Why, we even saw the Nephilim giants, the Anak giants from the Nephilim. Alongside them, we felt like grasshoppers. And they looked down on us as if we were grasshoppers. Let's stop there for the sake of time. We've got our foundation, our story. That's what's going on. We're going to pray, and then we're going to read the text that we will actually preach from. Let's pray. Father, thank you again for today. Thank you for this word. I need you completely in order to minister this word. I'm asking that you would take hold of my mind and my thoughts. Take me in the direction that you would have me to go. Touch my mouth and my vocal cords and help me today. Speak through me. Help me to share your heart and to point people to Jesus. I thank you for it. In your name, amen. All right, I'm going to get all this taken care of and start with. Now, if you are uh, at Joshua chapter 5, Let's go ahead and read there. Joshua 5 and verse 10. So now we're looking at Joshua and the Israelites entering the promised land. Entering the land of Canaan, which the children of Israel have now waited hundreds of years to come back to. And they're beginning to conquer bit by bit, city by city to reclaim, to retake 
what God promised to Abraham, and to Isaac, and to Jacob. And so that is what's happening. Uh, this is the land that they had just checked out. This is the land that we read in the last portion that they had brought back this good report. There's great fruit in the land. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. And that term milk and honey, to say that a land is flowing with milk and honey, it means that there's lots of livestock and lots of vegetation. That's what that term means. It means the, the land is rich. It means there is great provision there. To have a land flowing with milk and honey, listen, if you have all of the livestock that you need that produces milk, you have meat, you have labor because you have oxen and you have donkeys and you have horses and you have cows. You've got animals that do everything that need done as well as supplying food. And then you have vegetation, you have fruit, and you have vegetables. And then there's uh, lots of grass to hold the land and make it good. And you've got rich soil. That is, so if you want to sum all of that up and say, is this a land of abundance and provision? You call it a land of milk, animals, and honey, vegetation. And so they come back with that report. So now they're conquering this. Joshua 5 and 10. While the people of Israel were encamped at Gilgal, they kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month in the evening on the plains of Jericho. And the day after the Passover, on that very day, they ate of the produce of the land. Somebody say the produce of the land. They ate of the produce of the land, unleavened cakes and parched grain. And the manna ceased the day after they ate of the produce of the land. And the manna ceased the day after they ate of the produce of the land. And there was no longer manna for the people of Israel. But they ate of the fruit of the land of Canaan that year. Do you remember manna? Do you remember when the children of Israel were wandering around in the wilderness and God protecting them, God providing for them, God leading them by a pillar of fire, by a night, a pillar of smoke, by day. God doing all these incredible things, and they kept complaining. He said, you bring us out here to die? We could have stayed in Egypt where we had it better. And so they're complaining. And Moses goes to the Lord on behalf of the people, and Moses prays, and God says, okay, He said, when you wake up in the morning, he said, there's going to be this stuff all over the ground. It's going to, uh, it's going to have a, a, a flavor of fresh oil and honey. It's going to be like fresh oil and honey. Friends, that's a Krispy Kreme donut. Thank you, Lynn Hiles, who I stole it from. But it's been a while since we've had Lynn Hiles here. Anybody remember Lynn Hiles? I talk to him all the time. We've got to have him back. But anyway, that's a Krispy Kreme donut. And so God has sent them this bread of fresh oil, and it's sweet. And it, it, it would appear. It would appear on the ground like hoarfrost, they said. It would appear all over the ground every morning, fresh every morning. And you couldn't save any for tomorrow couldn't save it. You were supposed to get enough for the day. And if you got more than you were supposed to, it didn't matter because what you didn't eat immediately was going to rot because God was going to send it fresh the next day. Until the night before, the day before the Sabbath, you would not order. You would gather. (laughs) God will take two manas, please. Going to need one for Sunday. And so you would gather twice as much And then you would have it that day, and you would have it on uh, the Sabbath, and it would not rot on that day. I think it's so funny 
I'm not telling people not to save money. I'm not telling people not to invest. I'm not telling people not to leave something to your children. But I do think it's funny the way that we are wrapped up around money. Uh, Manna was their provision, and he said, don't store it up. I'll provide today, and I'll provide tomorrow. Isn't that amazing? And so, uh, you know, the term manna, the word manna literally means, what's that? What's that? Because when they saw it on the ground, they didn't know yet what was going on. And they said, what's that? They said, manna? Manna? And Yep, manna. And so then they called it manna. They called it, what's that? So anyway... For all of this time now, they've been eating what's that every day, fresh what's that, and they're used to it uh, appearing. It is miraculous provision. Miraculous provision. God, while they are traveling place to place in the wilderness and camp to camp and circling the mountain over and over again, like they were never supposed to do, but... Through their disobedience, their entry to the promised land was delayed. But God is sending this miraculous provision. Now, that's pretty cool, isn't it? It would be neat if when you woke up tomorrow morning, you opened the door, you look outside, and there were $100 bills that had appeared all over the ground. You would say, what's that? The ground is covered in hundos. Let's go get them. <laughs> And so you're gathering up Benjamins, you know, and you just put them in the sack, you know. And the ground is covered in money. And you get as much as you need for that day. And then tomorrow, here's some more $100 bills all over the ground. Wouldn't that be great? It would, wouldn't it? But guess what? That's not really God's way. God's way is really that if you don't work, you don't eat. Come on. God's way is not that we sit in our house and don't interact with people and just gather provision and stay right here. No, God's way is that we go out and we be, uh, we, we, we be part of um, life with other people. And we are working. We're, we're working and earning. We're taking advantage of the system that God has given. We're subduing the earth and we're doing something with it. And through that channel, God pours his provision. But right now, in this special circumstance, God is sending miraculous provision. Miraculous provision. God's heart was never that the miraculous provision would last forever. God's miraculous provision was ordained for a season. It was not supposed to be the way forever. It was supposed to be for a time. It was supposed to be until the children of God came into their place. The miraculous provision that they didn't have to do anything for was not supposed to be eternal. It was supposed to get them from point A to point B when they did not have everything they needed. Everything they needed existed in the place that God had ordained for them to go to. Are you picking up what I'm putting down? Only because they were not to the place of maturity yet. Wandering around in the wilderness, they're like babies, okay? They're young in this thing. They have not come into the land of fruition. They have not come into promise. They have not come into God's perfect will and plan. They have not come into uh, everything that was intended. They are not walking in their calling. They are not victorious over the inhabitants of the land. God's will is that while they are carnal, we will say, before they have taken their rightful place, I will send miraculous provision every day. When they come into maturity, there is not a need for miraculous provision. 
when they come into their place, when they come into fruition, when they are finally to the land of promise where I've actually ordained for them to be, there is not a reason for me to spoon feed them anymore. Because they have grown to the place of... Are you hearing me today? Hopefully this is helping somebody already. They have grown to the place of promise. So all all these years, all this time, they're talking about the promised land. They're talking about, oh, when we get to a land flowing with milk and honey. They're talking about this, but day after day living off miraculous... Living off of miracles. They're living... Every day on miracles. And then they arrive. And they partake of the fruit of the land. And they make bread. They make unleavened cakes of parched grain. All of a sudden, they are eating off of the trees. And they are eating from the work of the ground. The ground that has been kept by their enemies. We talked about that a while back. Why all of the enemies didn't just disappear when they entered. But the Bible says that God left their enemies there until they got there to take care of the ground for them and keep the wild beast away. Sometimes you're trying to pray away your enemies, but they're preserving your stuff until it's time for you to get it. Come on, somebody. So when they get there and they begin to eat of the trees and they begin to eat of the, of the grain, what happens? The miracle stops. The miracle stops. Hmm. We might think it's okay for their story, but we don't really like it for our story. We don't want it to be that maturity means not being spoon-fed by Daddy God's miracles. What we want is the promise of God and also the coddling of God. Now we're preaching, come on. We want to get all the stuff God said, and God still do everything he did. Come on, somebody. While we are there. If I stop now, I've given you the, I've given you the message. From here, we're just going to milk every part. There was temporary miraculous provision until they got where they were going. When they arrived at the God-given destination, they were not supposed to live off miraculous provision. They were supposed to grow up and tend the land for themselves using wisdom, using hard work. You see, God's provision is based on principles. God's provision is not based on miracles. God can provide miraculously. God does often provide miraculously. And thankfully, God meets us wherever we're at. God will meet us in our infancy. And God will do whatever needs done to grow us. But God's heart is that when he grows us, that we are grown Come on. God's provision is based on principles. God's children are not intended to live on miracles. We are intended to live on principles. Do we believe in miracles? Yes. Do we ask for the miraculous? Of course. Do we see God's miracles? Yes, we do. But are we supposed to depend on miracles? No. Are we supposed to live from miracle to miracle? Are we supposed to live any way we want to live, make the same old decisions we used to make, act like carnal people, do all the dumb stuff? Are we supposed to sow seeds of chaos, seeds of sadness, seeds of destruction, and then pray, and God just hand us another miracle? 
I'm glad that he has many times, but no, that is not God's best for us. God's best is that he gets us to a place of maturity, and all of a sudden we start making good decisions. All of a sudden we change the way that we parent. All of a sudden we change how we operate in our marriage. All of a sudden we change how we operate in the ministry. All of a sudden, we change how we do on the job, and what happens is that we begin growing good harvest from good seed and eating perpetually on God's goodness instead of on miracles from heaven. Am I helping anybody? The greatest miracle of all is to not need one. The greatest... Here, Summer. The greatest, I just barely saw you through the lights. The greatest miracle of all is not to need a miracle. Now, thank God for all of the miracles of cancer being healed and broken bones put together and heart disease, God touching. Thank God for all of that. But is a, is a, is a better miracle, I got this and got rid of it, or is a better miracle, hey, God showed me a way to live above it and not get it. Amen. Come on, somebody. I'm not judging anything. I'm, not ju- I'm, I'm saying it would be so awesome to live strong and full and healthy all the time. You know, because a lot of what we have and a lot of what we run into comes from things that we're sowing that we might not even, some stuff they put in our food, we didn't even know they put in our food. Come on. Miracles. Not supposed to live on miracles. The problem with God's kids is that we don't ever want to grow up. The problem with the children of God is that we want to stay children. We want to stay babies. We remember a time when God was always spoon-feeding us, like right after we got saved. Oh, if I could just go back to how it was when I first got saved. You want to go back to when you were an idiot? You want to, you want to, you want to go back to where you just barely had forgiveness, but you were still dumb and knew no kingdom principles? You want to go back to where you were saved, but you weren't ruling over anything? No, in the kingdom of God, we don't go back to anything. We go forward to everything. You know, we sing that, and I'm not telling you not to sing, you know, take me back, take me back, dear Lord, to the place where I first received you. You know, we love to sing. I'm not telling you not to sing the song. What I'm saying is in the kingdom, we don't ask God to take us back to victory. We say, God, I don't know why this is or why that was, but God, take me forward to victory. God, take me forward to conquering. God, take me forward to success and forward to health. Teach me principles. The difference between the prayer of a baby Christian and a mature saint usually comes down to this. Baby Christians, God, would you give me? God, would you give me? God, would you give me? The mature saint says, God, would you teach me? God, would you teach me? God, would you teach me? God, give me the stuff I need. God, teach me what I need and what I don't need. God, hand me success. God, would you make me like you? God, would you get me over this situation? God, would you help me to bear your image in this situation? God, would you add to me? God, would you take away anything that would hinder my walk or me glorify? Come on, somebody. God, could I get some more of that manna? God, would you show me how to till the ground? Come on. This is good, isn't it? Hallelujah. We remember a time when God 
was spoon feeding us. And now we kick and scream and insist on remaining babies. And then we call that a prayer life. I pray. I pray every day. No, you grovel and beg and complain every day. And at the end, you say amen. That's not a prayer life. That's not a prayer life. That's about stuff. This is about him. This is about things. This is about God. We would rather be coddled by God than to conquer with God. Can I tell you, it was easier wandering lost in the wilderness on miraculous provision than having to war with giants in the center of God's will. You see, we've got it all mixed up, though. We say that if there are giants, it's not God's will. We say if we got to put in too much work, it's not God's will. We say God's will is easy street and free manna in not having to figure it out. Isn't it funny what the Bible calls God's will? Isn't it funny what the Bible shows us is the place of promise? Because easy doesn't mean God. And hard doesn't mean the devil. Listen, when you mature, when you get in a place where you've been at it and you have wisdom... He doesn't hand you wisdom for wandering around in the wilderness on free manna. He hands you wisdom to go up and take the land. You are a ruler. You are a soldier. You are a warrior. You are kings and priests and a peculiar people, a royal priesthood and a chosen nation. It's funny because during the inter- just before the intermission time, We all raised our hand for the different prayer needs we had. I wonder how we view what we were praying about in light of what we're sharing right now. It's funny how our prayer life changes when we begin to see things in God's perspective. When we get on board with God, a lot of the things we complained about, we start thanking Him for. I used to complain because the free manna truck didn't show up on time. Come on. I used to praise God for the stuff and complain when I didn't have the stuff. Now I find myself thanking him for giants. Now when I see giants in the land and when I don't see him handing out free stuff, my mind has changed through the years. I've started adapting from carnality to spirituality, and now I look differently. I look around differently. I observe differently, and I say, hold up. I've heard something about this before. God, I must be coming into my season. God, there are giants. I must be in the land. God, I'm having to work for this thing. This must be the long-lasting sustenance. Have I graduated past the miracles into the principles? God, am I operating in my sonship? God, am I out of diapers? God, am I off the box? Because over here, the stuff you're complaining about and the stuff you're uh, asking God for, it just says two things to me, diapers and bottles. You can tell when they come to the altar what they ask. Everybody's going to be scared now to request prayer. (laughs) You can tell, listen, when they say, hey, would you pray about this? And you're like, babies, (laughs) you know? And then you get over here and you're like, soldiers, soldiers. This this comes with some stuff. You see, we, we would like there to be a God's will with no battle scars. 
But that's not how this thing works. God's will comes with some wounds, but then they get healed, and then you got a scar. And I can tell you today, there's a difference between a wound and a scar. Some of y'all have been trying to pray your scars away. Baby, don't do that right now. I'm trying to make a point. Some of you have been trying to pray your scars away. You don't pray your scars away. A scar is a reminder, this used to bleed, but now it's healed. This exists in the land of promise. This exists in the place God has called you to. A couple weeks ago, we told you if you think something's wrong, there might actually be something right. It may be that you're finally coming into your season. But we'd rather be coddled by God than conquer with God. Most people, when they say they want God, they really mean they want what God can do for them. And they want him to do everything. When I say I want God, I mean I want to know him. I want to know him. I want to be acquainted with him. I want to understand his way. You know how God is jealous for us. Not jealous of us. Jealous for us. I'm jealous for God. I want to know God. You know, I'm, I'm trying to read the Bible through uh, in six months. Because last year we did it in a year. But some of the things that were fresh on my mind, later I needed to connect those dots, but it had been almost a year. And I thought, oh. I thought, if I read it in six months... Maybe I can trace back. So that's, that's my goal. So I've been, I've got a, a, you know, a Bible reading plan, but I just do like double or triple or four times every day. This last week, I got this chest thing, and it really threw my week off. I've had no energy and this and that. Anyway, it threw off my Bible reading. So I guess it was Thursday or Friday. Rose, Rose always, we, we want to talk in the morning, almost every morning, Rose and I talk about the Lord, talk about the Bible and, you know, what we're seeing, what we're learning, this and that. And she said, hey, where are you in your Bible reading? And I said, I'm, I'm here. She said, oh. I said, excuse me. I said, where are you at? She said, well, I'm already in Listen, competition is my middle name. And I'm sorry if that includes my relationship with the Lord. And maybe that's still carnal and God's got to work it out of me. And so this happened right before she went to take a shower or something. And so a few minutes later, you know, she's done taking a shower and everything. She comes downstairs where I'm sitting at the kitchen table with my Bible app going, and she said, what are you doing? <laughs> Nothing. She said, are you reading God's word to be ahead of me? I said, you're not going to know Jesus better than me, Rose. I love Jesus more than anyone, and I'm going to know him better than everyone. She said, oh, my gosh. She said, I'm understanding you better all the time. I said, don't worry about me. I said, me and Jesus have been like this a long time. I said, leave it alone. Leave it alone. When I say, <laughs> wow, pride goeth before a fall. So I'm just going to stand over here. <laughs> watch out you know what he did to Paul <laughs> knocked him off his high horse all right did you get to that part yet because I've been reading it since I was like 11 <laughs> oh these babies <laughs> Y'all better, better watch her, though. She's passing everybody up. Yeah. How, far, how far are you in your Bible reading this year? Uh, well, I'm doing the, through the Bible story, so it's going yeah. through, like, the Hebrew. Yeah. How the Hebrew people yeah. 
Oh, she's reading it like the Hebrew people. That's awesome. A hundred two days ahead? Oh. That will change because I've got a long flight to Kenya. <laughs> I'm not even going to talk to the other pastors on the plane. They're like, what are you doing? And I'm going to have headphones. I'm going to be just twitching and saying, beat Kayla, beat Kayla, beat Kayla. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Where are we at? So listen, be it for ill motives or not, when I say I want God, I want God. I want to know him. I want to be intimately acquainted with him. I want to know how he's reacting in situations. I want to hear him when he laughs, and he does, and I've heard him. I want to hear him when he laughs. I want to hear him say no. I want to hear him say go. I want to walk with him. I want to know God. I want to know his ways. I want to be a man of God, not a baby of God. Psalm 103, 7. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the people of Israel. The people of Israel saw the fire, they saw the smoke, they saw the manna, they saw the, the, the rock spouting water, they saw these things, they saw those that had been bitten, bitten by vipers and then a brass bronze serpent being raised up and then these were healed. They knew his acts. The people of Israel, they saw God's acts day in and day out, but Moses knew his ways. Moses had been to the mountain. Moses had been in the cloud. Moses had seen God walk by. Come on. Moses knew his ways. So you can know his acts if you want to, but I'm hungry for his ways. I would rather have giants and him than ease and only knowing his hand when he's throwing out the grain in the morning. Come on. It's the same problem we have in our country right now. It's the mentality. If you want to, I'm, I'm, I'm not trying to pick on a political party this week. I'm not trying, but I want to, but I want to, I want to give you a thought. I want to give you a thought. This is the problem we have in our country. There is an anti-God mind frame. They don't understand how it works. They want a big government they want big government. Take care of me, government, while I do nothing. I don't want to work, but I want my iPhone. I want my stuff, but I want y'all to pay for it. I want education for free, not worried about my great-great-grandkids who it's going to catch up. Come on, somebody. This mentality, they don't understand the system. They don't understand how it's set up. Instead of learning to take care of themselves. We have a whole world that wants to be taken care of instead of caring for themselves. It's this same spirit. It's this same mindset that we're talking about. But I want to know him. I want to grow to the point where I'm learning to walk in his principles for I'm working the land of my life and things are being produced because I've listened to his voice and I've obeyed and now something's coming up from the ground because I sowed good seed. I don't want God handing it all to me. That wouldn't make me a good son. Come on. I want to grow up in this thing. Isaiah 28 and 9. To whom will he teach knowledge? And to whom will he explain the message? Those who are weaned from the milk. Those who are taken from the breast. Those that are not requiring breastfeeding anymore. Those who have grown to solid food. I want to be that guy. Come on. I want to be that guy. Everybody says... I used to feel God all the time. I want to be back where I used to be, where I feel God all the time. Well, first of all, in this kingdom, we don't go back to anything. We go forward to everything we said. 
But secondly, the reason that you felt God all the time is because you were a baby. When our kids are babies, that's when we make sure they know we are there every waking moment and most of the sleeping. But as they begin to grow and are able to learn, we immediately start to teach them how to do things for themselves. The goal is not that they realize for their whole life that we're going to do everything. That's not what we want that's best for our kids. That we continue, that they're conditioned, that we will still do all of it. No, no. We immediately teach them how to do things for themselves. Training them to stand, literally and proverbially, on their own two feet. So that they can have a successful, victorious life and... We immediately begin, we might not even realize this, you might not know this, but as you're teaching your kids how to stand on their own two feet, you're preparing them for the day when you're gone. The greatest gift you can give to your children is to prepare them for your death. That's the goal. And if you pass and your kids lose it, can't keep their stuff together because they are because you're gone you failed because their whole life you're supposed to be teaching them how to do this without you come on somebody sometimes people think that if they don't feel god the same way in this season that they did in another season that somehow something is wrong or that they're not in god's will but perhaps you're growing up when something's wrong, something's right. Perhaps he's pushing you out of the nest so that you will learn to fly. Now, it doesn't mean that he isn't there. It means he's not doing what he did before while he's there. Man, this is good. If I was sitting where you sit, I'd be up shouting and dancing. If your mom did for you now, Everything that she did for you when you were 12 or everything she did for you when you were 1, 2, and 3, come on, you wouldn't get very much done at work, would you? Or for your own family. There is a turning over, although I do make my mom still cook me breakfast and I go over there and eat it. Oh, I try not to let my sister know, but anyway, Heather will say, did you have breakfast with your mom today? And I'll say, yeah, and I, I slept between them too. <laughs> There's a turning over. There's a transition. There's a development. There's a change. Does it always feel good? No. No, it doesn't feel good, but that doesn't make it a bad thing. The change of growing up doesn't feel good either, does it? As things begin to change in life, leaving home can be uncomfortable. You encounter a lot of things you've never done on your own, but that doesn't mean that it's wrong. It just means it's different. It is growth, it is maturity, and quite honestly, it's everything you prayed for. But you didn't realize that this is what you were praying for. So, God begins to speak to us differently. And the hope is that we begin to speak to God differently. 1 Corinthians 13, 11, the Apostle Paul says, When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. But when I became a man, I gave up childish ways. More manna, please. Don't want to think. Don't really want to go where I'm supposed to go because there's giants over there. I don't want to deal with them. I don't want to work the land. 
I don't want to get up at a certain time. I don't want any conflict. I don't want any adversity. I don't want any controversy. I don't want to deal with growing up. I just want... I just want to sit over here sucking my thumb and you rain down manna because it's easy. This is not what I want. This is not what I want in my life and in my walk with the Lord. 1 Corinthians 3, 1 through 3. I, brothers, could not address you as spiritual people, but as people of the flesh, as infants in Christ. I fed you with milk, not with solid food, for you were not ready for it. And even now you are not yet ready, for you're still of the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh? And behaving only in a human way? Isn't it funny? The things that we make the major themes of our life. They said this about me. And then they left. And I should have got that promotion. And they should have handled it this way. And... We're filling our mind and our mouth and our time and our household with a lot of carnal junk that really doesn't matter. When Paul told Timothy, he said, don't get entangled to the stuff of this life. He said, a soldier doesn't get entangled in civilian matters. And then beyond all that, why are we so worried with what everybody else is doing? You are so worried about stuff that has nothing to do with you. Well, I just don't know why she went over there and did that. Looked like she had enough on her own plate to take care of it. It is none of your business. Why are you so worried about everybody else? Why are you giving your time? Why are you filling your mind with it? And while you're doing that, you're not reading the Bible. You're not filling your mind with anything spiritual to convert your mind and get it off these things. You are so worried about what the world's doing. Stuff that you can't fix, stuff that you can't change, stuff that is not your responsibility. Worried about everybody else on the job, worried about everybody else in the family, worrying how your your brother is doing over at his house, worrying about somebody else's kids, worrying about this going on. Would you mind your business? And start getting full of the word of God and let God order your steps and dictate your path. Go over here and start slaying real giants and eating of the good of the land. We've got to grow up. We've got to grow up. 1 Corinthians 3, 3. For you're still the flesh. For while there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not of the flesh and behaving only in a human way? For when one says, I follow Paul, and another, I follow Apollos, are you not being merely human? Even in the church. Even in the church, we get our eyes fixed on men. We get our eyes fixed on human beings. I'm about this. I'm about this. I follow this teacher. I'm under this group. I'm under this teacher. Paul says, I can't even give you the good stuff. He says, I can't even feed you solid food. He said, because you're still on the bottle. We will complain to God. And we will even complain about God. That we do not yet have what we want to have. Or that we are not yet where we want to be. The problem is that we believe we're simply going to go wherever we're supposed to be. But God's way is that we grow wherever we're supposed to be. Grab your neighbor and tell him, grow up already. Grow up already. When God, (laughs) I didn't know you'd take so much time enjoying that. When God told the Israelite children, To go up and take the land? I'm sorry, not God. When Caleb said, let's go up and take the land, he could have just as easily said, let's grow up 
and take the land because it was coming with a lot. You see, we keep telling God everything we want to know, but we won't even open the book that's teaching us all of those things. I'll close with this thought. If I were in medical school, if I was in medical school, if I was in medical school, I could beg the professor, Professor, please pour the information into my head so that I'll be a great doctor. And I could even ask him, would you just lay your hand on me and just impart the information? But the truth of the matter is there's only one way to know something. And that is to get to know that something. you got to open the books. Your university professor cannot impart the information without you reading the information and listening to the words. But every week, untold tens of thousands of Christians beg God, just put it in me. God, just fill me so full of the Holy Spirit. God, just fill me with wisdom. You want his wisdom? It's in the book. You want his spirit? It's in the book. God, I want to think like you. It's in the book. You see, babies have books read to them. But students read books for themselves. If we want to grow up and take the land, listen, it was the land of promise. God protected this land for them. Everything God wanted for them was in that land. But the only way to get it was to go and take it bit by bit, city by city, region by region, battle after battle after battle after battle. And it wasn't fun, and it was bloody, and it was hard, and it was uncomfortable. But there was no turning back. Because that's what comes with the good stuff. Grow up and take the land. So where are you? Where are you? And where do you want to be? What is your prayer life like? Baby Christian? Or soldier? Infant? Or great grandma? Come on. Are we praying, give me prayers? Or teach me prayers? Are we praying all miracles? Or are we praying principles? Because this is where you learn to live. Over there, it was easy, but anything that happened, ouch, that hurt. Ah, you offended me. Moses, he took my stuff. Tell him to give my toy back. This is where you become bulletproof. This is not where the storms stop. This is where the storm can't move you. This is not where giants disappear. This is where you slay giants. Come on. And this is where I want to live. Let's grow up and take the land. It's going to take real prayer. It's going to take you dedicating, committing a portion of your day to the Lord, to spend with Him. It's going to take you opening the textbook and getting the information. It's going, to take some, it's going to take forgiving some people that you don't want to forgive. It's going to take being kind to some people that you don't want to be kind to. It's going to take some self-sacrifice. Be ye a living sacrifice. 
It's going to take giving up time and doing some things for people that you wish you were doing something for you. You'd like to be out there with your manna basket, just collecting manna. And God says, no, you're going to fast today. And you're going to go help these folks. Come on, somebody. we got to grow up and take the land. In our Christian life and in ministry, we climb to a higher height, okay? And it's struggle. What I'm going to give you right now is going to be encouraging and sobering. You hit a struggle, and you need, like, this information that's up here. You climb, you climb, you climb. Boom, you get it. And you're like, ah, made it. Mountaintop. And then you begin to enjoy that revelation. And you're chilling out. And then you hit conflict. And then you climb. And it's a struggle. And then finally, you're like, oh. You get through that. And you're further than you were here. And then you begin to operate in that revelation. You begin to operate in a new level of faith. You know, the Bible says faith to faith. It really says he gives you one faith that arouses to the next faith. So you operate in this one. But now that you're here, what you thought like, oh, man, it could never get any better than this. You get used to it. And now you're just operating there. It doesn't have the same excitement as it used to because you're, you're walking in it. Like you got that thing. Pretty soon you're like, hmm, seems like there'd be even more. And God's like, oh, yes, there's lots more <laughs> where that came from. And he calls you up a little bit. Christian, this is going to be your whole life. It's going to be climbing and struggling. It's going to be revelation. It's going to be operating in the new level and then getting accustomed to it, hitting conflict and climbing. That's it. And we're going to do it as long as we're on this earth. But I have to tell you, every, every peak which turns into a plateau, this stuff that used to wreck my whole world doesn't even bother. I mean, I don't even think about not going to sleep. I'm like, oh, that, I forgot about that. And it used to rock your... It's, we, we, never want to, we never want to denigrate or negate a problem that somebody brings. You know, if your kid's math homework isn't done, to them that feels as big a deal as you with your taxes. And we don't want to tell our kid, that's not important, wait till you grow up and have to do taxes. No, this is real. And this is where they're at. It's funny because I'll get a call or a text and they'll say, oh man, such and such just happened. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't have... And I remember 30 years ago when I cared. And I kind of chuckle. And they don't know that that's not a giant. They're like, oh man, I just ran into Goliath. You know? And you're like, oh no, that's not Goliath. That's a gentle breeze. Goliath. <laughs> Goliath is actually here, and God says, no, that's actually a gentle breeze. <laughs> it's just funny because the cycle never ends, but the stuff that used to rattle you, you're like, Psh. and I like living up here. I, like, I remember that. What am I telling you? Don't stop. What am I telling you? It's worth the battle. It's worth the fight. It's worth the climb, you know. I, uh, <laughs> I've always got a battle going on in my head if I'm going to say something or not. I had this friend one time. He was about this tall. He was about this tall. And we were having a New Year's Eve party, and we had invited him. And uh, he, said, uh, he said, I don't have a date. I don't have a date. I said, well, you had to bring a date? I said, just coming to the house, eating wings, you know, whatever. And so anyway, he's like, what about so-and-so, you know? She was real tall, real tall. And I was like, oh, you like her? He said, I don't know. I've got to figure out if she's worth the climb. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my God. 
I've been laughing about that for 15 years. 15 years. Anyway, listen, the battle's worth the battle, and the climb is worth the climb. It is worth the climb. Don't stop, and it's okay. And let me give you a little, let me pull back the veil. The thing that has been rattling you like crazy that you don't know if you're even going to make it through, let me encourage you. You are going to get to a point when you look back and say, oh, that didn't have any power, did it? That could have never did what I was freaking out thinking it could. No, no, it can't. No, it can't. Because your daddy is bigger than that thing's daddy. Your God is so big. God is so big. And he's so good. And he loves you. You're going to make it through this thing. You're going to make it through this thing. But grow up. Don't stay here. Don't stay in this self-centered prayer life. And maybe, you know, a lot of times we don't even realize it. And then all of a sudden we're like, oh, yeah, that, that was all me. Don't stay here. Keep climbing. Keep moving. Keep climbing. Let's grow up and take the land. Would you stand with me this morning? Give the Lord a mighty hand clap. I feel like he's really, really spoken to our hearts today.